All right. You are listening to 91.5 WUML Lowell Blues Deluxe. And I have the honor of Steve Katz with me today. How are you, Steve? Good, John. How are you? Very, very good. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you on the show with me. Thank you. Um, let's go back to the beginning where you uh, grew up and music you were listening to as a kid. <laughs> Well, the music I was listening to when I when I was a kid, yeah, Perry Como, Eddie Fisher, Tony Bennett, Harry Belafonte. Wow, need I go on? Yeah, yeah, I, I loved those early. I, I I first got one of those little RCA boxes, you know, that you put the forty fives on, on the spindle. Yeah, and uh, I would run to the record store. Well, as fast as I could at like eight years old and buy as many records as my parents would allow. And I would just sit there and listen to, to, those, uh, to those 45s. And I see when you were 15, you uh, studied guitar with Reverend Gary Davis, of all people. Well, actually, yes, I took a few lessons with Reverend Davis. I mainly studied with Dave Van Ronk. Yep, Dave Van and, Ronk uh, as well, yep. And uh, Stefan Grossman, uh, at some point, who is my, my friend at the time, my best friend at the time, and still is. Uh, Stefan said, well, you know, why don't you, you should really go up to uh, uh, South Bronx and, and uh, take a, a lesson or two from uh, Reverend Davis. And that's what I did. What was he like, Reverend Gary Davis? Oh, he was great. He was very funny. Um, he was, uh, he was fun to be with. Um, I, I would go up there and he would joke around a lot, you know, and I had like a blonde guitar and he put it up to his eyes and said, oh, I, I like this color. And I almost fell off my chair. You know, it turns out <laughs> that Reverend Davis actually was able to see a little bit of color. He but was I, blind. I, I mainly went on the road with him and um, I took him up to uh, Saratoga, you know, to Cafe Lena, which is still open. And uh, he, uh, Annie, his wife, called me one day and said, uh, Reverend Davis wants to go to the Village Gate and hang out with uh, Brownie, uh, with Sonny and Brownie, mainly Sonny, he was very close with, you know, from that old North Carolina blues thing. Yep. And so I said, sure, I'll come, come pick him up. And at that point, they were living in Jamaica, Queens. And I, I picked up Reverend Davis and we went into the Village Gate and um, we, we, uh, we watched uh, Sonny and, and Brownie do their set and they opened for Roland Kirk. And... Uh, after their set, I took Reverend Davis backstage and uh, remember Reverend Davis is blind, uh, Sonny Terry blind and Roland Kirk was blind. And so there we were like shuffling around backstage and three, Reverend three, Davis, bli three blind men, right? <laughs> three blind men. And Reverend Davis bumps into Roland Kirk and who he didn't know, but uh, they hugged each other and uh, I had to pull him apart and say, Reverend Davis Brownie's over here. I mean, Sonny's over there, you know, so <laughs> it's one, one of the funniest things that happened in my youth. And you got to meet Sunhouse and a whole bunch of people, Skip James and Mississippi John Hurt, I saw too. In yeah, John. In fact, John Hurt, uh, when Stefan and I went, we left the Even Dozen Jug Band and we went out to California and we played the, uh, the uh, uh, Ash Grove. And the week before was John Hurt, but John was still staying at the uh, apartment that they gave him uh, for an extra week. And we were there also. So we got, we got to be very close. And uh, John Hurt was just a, a lovely, wonderful, wonderful person. And Stefan and I met this kid um, who was a great guitar player. And we said, why don't you join us, you know, be part of our band. And uh, which was called the Gramercy Park Sheiks. And uh, yeah, the kid said, uh, sure, I'd like to do that. So Ry Cooter played with us for a week. We were the Gramercy Park Sheiks. Wow. Me, Stefan, and Ry. Yes. Uh, I mentioned Sun House. Yeah, they put out a new record that was, uh, I guess, in the can. They never released just recently a live recording from 62, which is yeah. unbelievable, the new record that they put out. Well, what's this song? I just watched a movie with uh, Grinning. What's the name of that song? It's just basically him talking. Grinning in my soul, yeah. God, is that fabulous? And I was oh, never, yeah. I was never a Sunhouse fan because I felt he was too rough for me. That's I was more of a John Hurt kind of uh, yep. guy. But this was just so fantastic. So you were in the Jug Band. You were, you played washboard in the Jug Band, right? Yeah. Wow, not guitar. I was, wash, 
I, I was the washboard player. There were there were twelve of us. It would change, you know, from five to fifteen, depending on who wanted to show up at rehearsals. And uh, I played uh, guitar because uh, I mean I played washboard because there were so many guitar players in the band and good ones. So I figured the only way I'm going to get to stay in this band is to play washboard. So that's what happened. I wasn't that bad actually. So were you listening to blues when when you were in school in college or high school or what were you listening to then? I was listening to blues. I mean, I had a, I, I had like a, a transistor radio with the uh, wire going up to my through my shirt, and I would sit there in math, which I hated, with the little uh, headphone in my ear, um, and I would either listen to the blues or I would listening to uh, WWVA in Wheeling, West Virginia, which we got in those days, yeah. and uh, or the Yankee games. There you go. And then in college, you uh, auditioned for the Danny Kalb, Kalb Quartet. Tell right. me about that. Right. Well, we, Stefan and I got back from California, and I wound up teaching at uh, Fred and Instruments on 6th Avenue um, next to the Waverly Theater in the village. And uh, I was teaching acoustic guitar, and I was still in college. And um, Danny came up. This is right after Dylan uh, played the Newport Folk Festival and all of my acoustic yep. friends were, all my acoustic and blues friends were going up to Manny's and trading in their acoustic guitars for electric guitars and amps. And uh, Danny, uh, Artie Tram was in the blues project then. Well, actually he wasn't even the blues project. He was uh, in Danny's band. And Artie had to go to Europe for a while. And uh, so Danny came up and asked me if I wanted to play rhythm guitar in his band. And I said, I never played electric guitar before. You know? I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do, you know. I said, well, we'll put a pickup in, you know, come up tomorrow to the Night Owl Cafe at rehearsal and we'll, we'll put a pickup in your guitar and see what happens. So uh, I came up and he put a pickup in the guitar, but the problem is, is that the, the uh, pickup was on 10 and then Danny plugged it in and the amp was on 10. <laughs> and I got like surrounded by this uh, sound of rhinoceros that's uh, attacking me. It was just horrible. And uh, so uh, I, I just I just put it down to zero my volume because it just it was too frightening to play an electric guitar. And so Danny, of course, being Danny, came over to me at the uh, end of the rehearsal and he, he said, "Boy, I really like the way you play. Uh, can you can you join us? You know, in the band?" And I, was, I mean, he he couldn't hear me because I, I turned down to zero, but I guess it was pretty tasteful what I was not playing. And um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I had term papers due and all that stuff, and I said, okay, so I, I got myself an electric guitar and went out, and uh, I think it was Boston, we played a, a, like a bar or something, and I just had the greatest time, and uh, I had a paper due on Yeats and the Byzantium poems, and I decided to forget Yeats and the Byzantium poems, I'd rather be a rock and roll musician, so that was the beginning of my uh, involvement with Danny and the Blues Project. And then the Blues Project, you were with Al Cooper as well. Al Cooper was, how did he get into the Blues Project with you? Well, we were doing, we were doing a demo with, uh, with uh, Tom Wilson. And uh, Tom was uh, using Al for, as for keyboard sessions, especially after uh, the Dylan, you know, he played organ on the Dylan's record. And we needed a keyboard player for uh, the Eric Anderson song, uh, Violets of Dawn, that we had recorded. And Tom suggested Al, and Al came to the session, and uh, and uh, I guess we got along. You know, and Al wanted to be in our band. And you had a song on that, on an album called uh, Projections, Steve's song. That was your song, right? You wrote Pro Projections. Yeah, I wrote it. Yeah, I. I mean, it's it's the story is is that the song was called September fifth. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> excuse me, we were on the road. And uh, we handed in the, the tapes and the artwork uh, to uh, MGM. And uh, they called our manager and our manager said, uh, hey, we got the, the tapes and we have the artwork, but we're missing the name of the second song on the first side. So our manager said, oh, second song, first side, second song. Oh, that's Steve's song. So they said, <laughs> thank you. And <laughs> so we get off the road and, and uh, we get to look at the proofs of the album, right? And it says, I don't know, what the hell is Steve's song? You know, so, 
So it went out like Steve's song. So whenever I do performances now, either by, by myself or even with the Blues Project, I tell the audience, you know, audiences that one of the reasons why I play out in front of audiences is because I want as many people to know that I would never, ever have a, a titled a song after myself. So I still call it September 5th, but it's Steve's song. And uh, you, Blues Project, uh, was playing quite a bit right there in the late 60s. You were uh, playing all the way up to the Monterey Festival. What happened? Why did, why did Blues Project break up at that point? We were just weren't getting along, really. Um, Cooper had left. He wanted to put horns in the band, and, you know, he had his problems with Danny, and, uh, and uh, so he left the band. Um, they, they actually tried to rescind our invitation to Monterey and we insisted, no, we, we, wanna you know, go. we, we want to go, you know, and then we went out there and it was, it was fabulous, you know, but, <clears throat> you know, we had John, John McDuffie, John, John was playing keyboards and, um, you know, we knew I was, I was trying to sort of like start to do my own thing anyway. And, uh, we were just sort of drifting apart. Um, but Monterey was great. I, I shook hands with Otis Redding and, uh, I was on the side of the stage when uh, Janice uh, did Ball and Chain, and um, I had dinner with Jimi Hendrix. Wow. We had, uh, it was a hot dog stand. But, uh, you know, people, my, my book company, uh, my publisher, when they were promoting my book, they said, well, Steve jammed with Jimi Hendrix. No, I never jammed with Jimi Hendrix. I shared a bag of potato chips with Jimi <laughs> Which I think is a lot hipper. I mean, how many well, people? Every everybody's jammed with Jimi Hendrix. Well, let's let's talk about Blues Project a little bit before I go on to the next part of your career. <laughs> okay. Blues Project, the, the the music that you guys were doing in Blues Project was different. It wasn't straight ahead, one four five blues. You guys were pushing the envelope a little bit. We were with, pushing the envelope. We would go out and and. Um, we would change things a lot because we didn't want to, I mean, Butterfield was doing the Chicago blues thing perfectly and beautifully. And we just took it into a psychedelic kind of uh, uh, way. We, 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 we improvised over it. And Danny and Roy and Danny and uh, Al were like, you know, they were, they were very much into their high notes. So every time we did a concert, it was like a, it was like a Punch and Judy show with uh, Danny and Al pounding each other over the head with these treble notes and getting louder and louder. And so it was, it was sort of like insane. And our music was insane. And we, we approached the blues in a sort of crazy way, you know, and uh, it was when, when Danny did the blues, I mean, he, he, he idolized uh, Muddy, Muddy. And, um, and we just took like two trains running and he, he tried and he could, couldn't really make it into his own. You can't do that. It's some, something like that. But uh, he did it. He, twisted it sort of and made it into, he did make it into his own, um, his version of it. So you guys, you, you guys broke up after Monterey. Right. And then you morphed into something else. You, you and Al and a couple other guys decided to play some of Al's music and you called, you called yourself Blood, Sweat and Tears after a while. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, Al was wanted to go to England and, uh, and start a career. And uh, he asked uh, myself, Bobby Columbi and Jimmy Fielder and uh, Fred Lipsius if we would back him up at the Cafe Ogogo to do a benefit uh, so he could raise enough money to, to get to Europe. And uh, he got enough money, he raised enough, we raised enough money to, for him to get a cab to the airport and back. And, uh, <laughs> and so we said, well, Al, you got some great songs. You know, we all had things to contribute why don't we just stay here and have a band? And he wanted to have horns and everything as part of it. That was Al really wanted horns. I agreed because we were both listening to the Buckingham's Time and Charges album. And uh, the, uh, the Buckingham's were using, actually Jimmy Garcio produced the album, and they were using horns from the Chicago Symphony. And the horn sections, the horn parts were not stock R&B parts. And uh, so we wanted to go in that direction uh, where it was just like more eclectic rather than just straight R&B. So you got a record deal. You, you, the first record, Child is Father to Man, was one of my favorite records 
that's Thank you. blood, sweat, and tears ever did. Well, we and that were, was that was the first, right? That was the first. Uh, we were um, courted by mainly two record companies, uh, Warner Brothers and uh, Columbia Records. And oh no, it was, I'm sorry, it was Electra Records and Columbia Records. And Columbia Records won out. Um, they they got to sign us because they gave us all this Fender equipment. Those are the days. Yeah, those are the you get days. a couple of amps, you know, and we'll sign with you. <laughs> <laughs> so then, after Child is Father to the Man, um, Al left again, right? Yeah, he yeah, left. We, we we wanted to. Bobby and I wanted a, a singer that we that that was more commercial than Al. We felt it was a it was a wonderful album. I still feel that way, but Al's voice really sort of like uh, held us back. And uh, we asked him to stay in the band and uh, just not be the lead singer. You know, just yeah. be the, the leader, the arranger, the whatever he wanted to be. And he didn't want to do that. He wanted to stay as the lead singer. So he had auditions. And, and you auditioned David Clayton Thomas, correct? Right. And he became the singer. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, he became the singer. He became the singer. And then you became a big band. That was when the that second album blew up. You guys were yeah. known everywhere after that. Yeah. Well, you know, when I when I left school, I was in pre law, and when I left to become a rock and roll musician, my parents didn't talk to me for a couple of years. <laughs> And uh, then when we had our first, I think it was You Made Me So Very Happy, was our first hit record. And, and uh, my mother called me and said, she says, Stephen, we knew it all along. So that so was how that. Long, how long were you with Blood, Sweat, and Tears? How many years? Six years. Six years. Yeah. And when you left, what were you doing when you left? Why did you leave? And, you know, what were you doing when you left, after you left? Well, I left because... For a couple of reasons one was that the band was becoming too the, the horn sections the, the the jazz players and and bobby they were becoming more it was they were yes. pulling the band into more of a jazz direction and uh, you know it just wasn't what you know i can't even I, I can hardly read music you know so uh it just wasn't right for me i mean i was a rock and roll and folk music person you know, i grew up with with the folk blues and uh there was that and also the fact that uh uh, I was getting very friendly with uh, Lou Reed. We were rehearsing at the same place at the time. And uh, another New York guy. Another, very, yeah, another one. <laughs> yeah, so, and, you know, Lou had just come off a, a bomb album uh, called Berlin, which is actually a very beautiful album, but very depressing. And uh, I told Al, I, I, I mean, I told Lou, I said, uh, you know, I think. RCA should have marketed the album, in, you know, and put Better. single edge razor blades in the uh, in the cell of fame. Um, anyway, Lou said, "What do you think I ought to do?" So I told him that I think you ought to get a great band together, do some of the Velvet Underground stuff, and uh, do a live album and get it out right away. And that was Rock and Roll Animal. And you you were a producer. You that's what you were doing next. You were producing records. Producing, records. yeah, yeah. I got into production. I left BS and T, and I got into production. Tell me about tell me about who else you were producing at the time other than Lou. There's a whole bunch of people you were involved with. Well, at that time, I produced a, an album by Elliot Murphy. Um, Elliot still loves this one. He says he keeps saying it's his favorite album. We're in touch a lot, and um, that was called Night Lights. I produced an album by Rory Block, which was uh, a problem. Uh, it was overproduced, actually. But, uh, um, I produced a band called, uh, which I'm sure everybody in your, your audience has heard of, called El Rocho. And we called the album the best of El Rocho's greatest hits, which of course never existed. But uh, yeah, so I produced a bunch of stuff then. And, and um, then I wanted to, well, I was asked to produce a, 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 a band by, with a, they, these managers wanted to put together Craig Fuller from Pure Prairie League and um, and uh, uh, Doug Ewell from the Velvet Underground. And uh, they asked if I wanted to be in the band. And I said, well, I'd rather, yeah, no, no, not, they asked if I was be interested in producing it for RCA. And I said, no, I'd rather be in, I'd rather be a musician, you know, working with those guys. 
And so that's what I did. And then we asked uh, Eric Cass to be part of that. We became American Flyer. Yeah. So then you moved into, you were uh, working for a record label, Mercury Records. Right. Right yeah. after. That was after, you were still producing, right? When you were there or not? I was still producing and I was going through a divorce and uh, and I, I figured that I, I really wanted to have uh, settled down and and learn the business a little bit more. So I think it was, it was a nice opportunity to, uh, I, 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 I became an a and R head of New York for Polygram Rec Mercury Records. And, uh, and then I was uh, elevated to vice president. Uh, it's funny, I mean, our, my boss, uh, Charlie Fash, I said, you know, my contract was up. I said, Charlie, I think I, I, think I, I need you to make me a vice president. <laughs> he's, he's, he said, why? Everybody's a vice president. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Thanks, Charlie. And then you signed an Irish group that no one knew about, Horse Lips, which I liked. Another group I love that you were part of, that you got Thank you. Of. Yes. And to this day, and I'm still close with a couple of the guys, um, Horse Lips was uh, part of a deal I did with uh, Dick James Music. Um, so it was that hit, Horse Lips and Johnny Guitar Watson <laughs> were the two acts. I mean, you can't find anything like further apart, but uh, um, I, I, I love Johnny. We we put out the uh, Real Mother for you, and uh, I'll, I'll just never forget going to the uh, the uh, the party that uh, Johnny Guitar Watson we threw it for him out in L.A. And he had a he had a purple car, and he had, and he had an outfit on that was purple, like exactly like his car, uh, which I thought was wonderful, and. Uh, but I, but the DJM deal, I went over and, and uh, said hello uh, to uh, to Horse Lips and uh, at one of their gigs in a place called Armagh, north of Dublin, and we partied. And they went back to my boss and said, "We want Steve to produce us." So I worked with them for three albums. One of those was one of those albums. Ian Anderson was on it, I think. No, that's uh, no. Jim. Jim uh, the. Uh, the uh, flute player, right, was in the bin. Yep. And then you were uh, you became managing director of Green Lynette Records in Ireland, or I an Irish record label. How did an that R happen? Irish, How yeah, that was that was here in Connecticut, actually. Was it? Yeah. How did that come about? Well, the the the, the guys in Horse Lips turned me on to some really wonderful uh, traditional music, Irish music. And I just fell in love with it and uh, things that I had never heard. And when I came back here, um, I met uh, Wendy Newton, who owned the, uh, the, the, the uh, preeminent um, Irish music lab, uh, label here. And uh, we got along really well. And she said she needed somebody at her, you know, to work with her at her company. And I said, oh, great, you know, I'd like to do it. So I got to work with some great musicians. And um, so after that, what were you doing after that period of time? I mean, you were involved with a lot of things in the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. Well, I, I, I met my wife, um, and my wife is a, a ceramic sculptor and a potter and, you know, and, uh, we, we were putting out, uh, a newsletter and, uh, we got a great, a great response where Allison called me at the office and said, uh, I need you to work with me with this, you know, and it's getting a great response. And I said, sure, I'd love to. So I, I stayed on at Green Linnet as a, as a, whatever you call it, an advisor and, uh, and uh, started working with my wife. And we've been doing that ever since. That was how long ago, Allison? 20, 30 years ago. Wow. That's quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, and, and every now and then I would, do a gig somewhere, you know, just a solo. I put together a, my own set, my own solo show. And then I wrote, I wrote, uh, I wrote a book in uh, 2015 uh, about my career and uh, my autobiography. And uh, how do people yeah. get that? What is it called? And how do people get the uh, your it's called um, is is Steve Katz a rock star? It's like, oh, Blood, Sweat, and My Rock and Roll Years. <laughs> and then the subtitle is, Is Steve Katz a Rock Star? And what you have to do is 
I'm going to, I'm going to put on a new window here for a second and go to my, uh, you can still hear me. Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. So what is it? Steve Katz music dot wordpress dot com. And people can get it there. It's right on the first page. As soon as yep. you click on that. And also my, I, I did a CD a couple of years ago of, uh, of basically my career, you know, I'm doing early, uh, early stuff. I do, you know, Mississippi Johnson. I do, uh, uh, Richland woman blues. And I do, uh, uh, from, uh, Skip James, I do a Crow James, and, and you know, on and on to, through the songs I wrote and things I did with BS and T and the Blues Project. So how do people get that? That's a CD, right? You, you, you're only yeah, solo. You, just, you can only get it on my website. And it's called what? The Juggle. The Juggle. The Juggle. That's right. The I juggle. forgot. It's the yeah. Juggle. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I printed up a whole bunch and I just sell it at my. You know, and people say to me, hey, why don't you, why don't, don't you want to have it on streaming and all that? So I really don't care. At this point in my life, I would just like to take it out on the road and sell it to people. And uh, I really don't care about airplay or any of that stuff anymore. So just recently, I, I saw that Blues Project was reformed back, I don't know, last year or the year before. What, yeah. what, what made you, was it you that got that started or other people from Blues Project before? I think it was mainly Roy, the drummer, and uh, Roy really wanted to do this. And it's only me and Roy uh, of the originals. Uh, well, actually, we did it with Danny for a little while. Uh, but then a couple of years ago, Danny couldn't, you know, because of health issues, couldn't do it. And <clears throat> so it was Roy and I that uh, we got uh, these great musicians together. Kenny Clark is one. and. Uh, Scott Petito and uh, Chris Morrison on guitar and uh, and and uh, Roy and I and we decided to go out and uh, and do some gigs. <coughs> Excuse me. So last this past autumn, <coughs> we did a nice little tour, and we're going to do one this coming autumn, another one. Wow! So people can see Blues Project again. That's great. Yeah, and I think it sounds great actually. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's it's better than what we used to do. And um, yeah, we're doing a lot of the old things, a few new things, but you know, we we're doing "I Can't Creep from Crying" and "Wake Me, Shake Me" and 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 uh, uh, September fifth, otherwise known as Steve's song, you know, stuff like that. And what about Blood, Sweat, and Tears? I know they've done reunions over the years. No, it's no, not they reunion. haven't. No, no, it's just uh, Bobby Columbia has the name, and he, he, they just hire you know, younger musicians, there's, there's no originals in it. I went back about uh, 12 years ago, uh, for a couple of years, and I was the um, only original. And wow. uh, yeah, and, 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 and it was just, it was just too much. I didn't, I didn't like to be an employee in my own, their own band that I started, you know, it was not fun. So I, I got that that's going on. But uh, we do have an uh, a film coming out. Okay. This year, uh, probably in the autumn, um, the uh, director John Scheinfeld um, did the uh, Harry Nielsen, the Nielsen movie. Yep. The documentary, and also the Coltrane movie, Chasing Train, and uh, the United States versus John Lennon. He's done some great movies. He's a great documentarian, and what he did was he was he got very interested in our trip to Eastern Europe because um, we the, the the State Department. Uh, was going to uh, get, they were going to take uh, David's, he, David's has, has like a little felony record in Canada. And they were going to take away his green card. And they came to us and said, well, listen, we're going to, you know, we're going to take away his green card unless you do a, a, a tour for us of Eastern Europe and represent <laughs> American youth. Wow. So, it was, yeah, it was, it's called extortion. And uh, it was, we, you know, we, we, we never, talked about it because we weren't allowed to. And so John felt that it was a great story. And I think it's a great story also. And he's gotten, he put together all this film with interviews with all of us. And also he went into the archives of the FBI and the State Department and the Nixon administration. And he came up with all of this stuff and there's incredible footage. And and uh, Columbia called me up the other day and said that he saw it uh, before the music was put in, it's still being edited. And he said, it's amazing, it's like a thriller. 
So uh, that'll be out. He's gonna, he, 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 what they do is they bring it to festivals, and then there they get distribution and stuff like that. So, so we'll be able to see it eventually. Yeah. Meanwhile, just to whet your appetite, we have a song in Licorice Pizza. <coughs> wow. That's great. Yeah, it is. Total surprise. So just recently, you were here at the Playing at the Bull Run I saw. Yes, I did that the other day, yeah. And that, that's solo stuff, right, you were doing, or was it career stuff that you were doing? I wasn't there, so I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't get to see it. Well, it's, my show is it's just me, acoustic, and, and it's, it's pretty much in chronological order, um, you know, from when I was, you know, taking lessons from Van Rock, Van Rock and, um, and Reverend Davis. And I, you know, I go on and on and, and up through the years. And, um, and but I, I tell a lot of stories, like you're hearing some of them now. Yep. And uh, that's part of my show. So it's like, you know, I, I learned to do that when, I, when my book came out because uh, uh, I did a book tour as well. So when I did my book tour, I always told people, well, listen, I do a concert also. So I combined that. So when I do my uh, performances, um, it's a combined uh, story and song, evening of story and song. I'm playing uh, next week at uh, Daryl's house uh, in Pauling. Pauling. Yeah, yeah, Pauling, New York. Yeah, see, if anybody's see, listening. And... How often do you do that? Two or three times a month, if that that's even, it. you know, be, because we still have our pottery business. And that's oh. Allison Palmer studio.com and uh, we're going on we're putting 75 new pieces onto shopify tomorrow morning great so all those things i have to photograph and then catalog and then put them up on so you're a busy guy between the two businesses you you run well that's not the only i do websites for people also mainly for artists crafts people and uh, so I, I do photography and uh, i got a whole bunch of things and and uh, you know and because allison is so busy i, I cook every now and then that's good. But that's from food delivery services because I don't know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like you said, Blues Project in the fall, in the autumn. We're gonna yeah. are they gonna be coming to New England, do you know? Yeah. 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 It's, I don't know where yet, but uh, it's it's if if you go on to thebluesproject.com um, and look at the tour, you know, that's how I find out where I'm playing. Nobody ever tells me these things. <laughs> No, it's fun. It's like the early, you know, music yeah. days, you know, when, when nobody knew what was going on. So what's the most important thing that's happened to you in your career? Can you, I know it's a tough question to ask, but in what do you career. think? Yeah. What do you think was the most important thing that's happened over your career to you, for you? I, you mean of like unforgettable moments? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we won the Grammy award for album of the year, um in 69 i think the awards were in 70 but that wasn't it it was it was getting the award uh, we were handed the award from louis armstrong and shaking his hand i think was a big uh, major thing um where's, where's your favorite place to play either here in, in the states or overseas oh that's a really good question i like to play overseas but uh you know because of the way things are in the economy and COVID. You know, I don't get any invitations, you know, but yes, it, yeah, I definitely like overseas, you know. I, I mean, I, I can think, like, answering your question, if it comes into my mind, would I rather play in Columbus, Ohio, or Paris, France? And I think it's a no-brainer. Where would you rather play? Overseas in Paris. There you go. <laughs> it's different. It's not like, you know... Here in the United States, it's it's much different than playing overseas. And every musician I've ever asked that question, they always have an answer of somewhere over. France is the one, basically. Everybody says they love playing in France. Oh, um, as far as like audiences go, yeah, yeah, it's it's it's. I would much rather play overseas. And you know, it's a history in America that uh, you know that that you have guys like uh, oh, what's his name. Uh, anyway, you, musicians go over there and they wind up playing and staying there, the jazz guys. Um, and uh, it's the same with folk or blues people. You know, the audiences are much more appreciative yeah. uh, than they are over here. 
Well, I know one. You know, Luther Allison is a blues guy. He was right. living in Wisconsin, but he lived in Paris because he was he was doing more there than he was over here. Yeah, yeah. And look at the late '60s. All the blues guys that went over to England and they recorded them over there. Yeah, Ben Webster moved to uh, Copenhagen. I saw him there actually in a park, and. Um, yeah, it's uh, what's the the, the the movie Round Midnight captures that really well. Right, right. So, how do people find out about you, Steve? Do you have a website, or is it the Blues Project website? What, what? How do people find out about you and your music and all of that and, stuff? Well, it it would be my website, and my website. I have a bunch of things that 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 are fun to. I have like archive pages with photos and things that go back to and you know yeah posters. i saw i saw those all the archive posters from yeah. shows you were at you played yeah. at yeah i'm mean, things that i i just found out it was about a year ago that somebody sent me uh the contact sheet of uh of us playing at the san francisco folk festival and it's just amazing you know and uh, so i i put all of that stuff onto my website which is stevecats.com steve cats that wait a second let me get it again so, see, there's a, there was another singer by the name of uh, with the same name, and he took stevecats.com, and so I'm just waiting for him to die so I can. <laughs> so it's a uh, stevecatsmusic.wordpress.com. There you go. And you're on some of the social media too, I take it. Oh, I lost him there for a second. Maybe he'll be back. He he shut down, so hopefully he comes back here in a second. I guess not. He must have logged off. Or lo anyway, you're listening to ninety one point five WUML Lowell Blues Deluxe. That was my interview with Steve Katz.